A group of travelers from a faraway land sneak in the tall grass of a vast plain. Exotic animals graze as far as the eye can see, each stranger than the last. The hungry company brandish spears, intent on hunting one of the beasts. One points at a mammal, bovine in appearance. The men nod mm -hmm. and begin to crawl closer. As they slowly inch towards their prey, it suddenly raises its head, setting its gaze in their direction. Afraid that it is his only chance, the hunter closest lunges forward. As the startled animal turns to run, molten inferno erupts from its hind parts, engulfing the unfortunate soul. A spire swallows the grasslands, the remaining travelers flee for their lives. As long as they live, they will not forget their tragic encounter with a bonnacon. Hey there, I'm a crowing cockatrice, and this time I've brought you quite a bizarre creature. The bonnacon, or bonuses, is a bull-like creature with some key differences. It has the mane and neck of a horse and twisted horns. According to the sources, they are twisted in such a way that they cannot be used for self-defense. Most medieval illustrations show it with goat or ram-like horns, with one image giving it antlers. Neither artist seems to agree on which way the horns twist, which is pretty unsurprising to be honest. Not only because these people never saw the animal, but also because animal depictions from this era can be notoriously misleading. I know of an illustration where an octopus is drawn as a lobster. Yes, that anatomically correct lobster is an octopus. Not to mention that, according to experts, the only surefire way to tell a beaver from any other animal is that they are depicted in the act of biting their own balls off. But alas, that is a story for another day. The most unique feature of the Bonnacon is its self-defense mechanism. Since it cannot fight with its horns, it flees from danger, and in doing so, it discharges its excrement. Sources differ on the range of this peak of blast, with the shortest stating only 30 meters, and the highest claiming more than 12,000? Although it apparently does not shoot its load all at once, instead spreading its shit in small tactical bursts. The dung itself burns, but it is not unanimous whether it does so like acid or causes actual flames. To understand where the Bonacon lives, we first need to take a look at the origin of its tale. During the first century, the Naturalis Historiae, or Natural History, was published by Pliny the Elder. It's one of the largest literary works to survive from the Roman Empire, discussing ancient knowledge of all sorts, animals being one of them. Pliny stated that the animal lived in Paeonia, an ancient kingdom most likely situated in the northern regions of present-day Greece. In the Middle Ages, scholars writing this series often repeated Pliny, but presumably at that point in time it was obvious that the Bonacon did not exist in Europe, so they moved its habitat to Asia. A few world maps show it in the northern regions. There, it was set to inhabit deserts and grasslands. It was most likely used as a sort of a shortcut, finding an easy way to populate terra incognite, or unknown lands, with animals and monsters. All the pictures that I could find of the Bonacon illustrate it as being hunted, mostly by men with shields, often wearing armor to protect themselves from the fecal napalm. This means that it was believed that either for meat or solely for sport, the beast was often hunted. The strange thing is, however, that two of the images show men with swords, a weapon that, to my knowledge, was reserved for the coup de grace finishing of the animal, not as the main weapon. It could be written off as some weird artist mishap like beavers performing oral castration on themselves, but even that is based on knowledge. Even though it's misinformation, it was believed to be true, and it's not like the concept of hunting was alien to these artists. Since there are other images of people hunting monsters with swords, perhaps it's a weapon reserved for them, or not knowing what could kill a Bonacon, they defaulted to the most common option. I honestly don't know. There might be some undiscovered history buried here, or I'm just crying away needlessly. So, 
after this tangent, let's move on to the second half of the video. We need to discuss how it has to be changed to be realistic. In the case of the beast's biology, there are a few changes that are necessary. Most of the body is fine as is. It even classifies the bonacon as a bovine, belonging to the bovinae family. But I would not go further than that for now. One of the two things that need to be changed is its horn, or rather, it has to be clearly defined. Going by real-world examples, we could take inspiration from some domestic water buffalo breeds. The Buffalo de Rio, Buffalipso, Godavari and Meshana varieties, for instance, have horns that twist over their head, which is one of the necessary properties, and these horns are still useful. And they do need to be useful. No animal would go to the length of growing horns if they have absolutely no function. I know medieval authors smothered things a bit, but Pliny wrote that they are no use in a fight in the context of predators and hunters. And with such an excellent secondary weapon, they do not need them for that either. But water buffaloes also use them for something else. Or rather, two things. For once, they fight to establish dominance charging at each other using their horns. And since this is a more sensible way as compared to shitting acid at each other, horns are indeed necessary. Their other use is in the creation of mud holes for wallowing. Perhaps also useful in taking sand baths in the desert. However, their effectiveness is surely diminished when compared to the massive horns some of the water buffaloes have. But let's not get carried away with the comparisons. The Bonacon is definitely not part of the same genus as there is one more very important thing we have yet to discuss. When I think of the Bonacon's defense mechanism, two animals come to mind immediately. The skunk and the bombardier beetles. We all know very well what the former does to attackers, but it does not carry the main properties of the Bonacon spray. However, this animal can shoot its load up to 3 meters far, while it's nowhere near the 30 meters mark, it's a start. We could borrow its two glands each side of the anus and the muscles allowing it to shoot far with high precision. We could also theorize that, being a larger animal, the Bonacon has stronger glands, gaining range of the spray. But I don't think the 30 meters are even necessary, 5 to 10 being a good compromise. But what does it spray? I toyed with the idea of something similar to the solution of the Bombardier Beetles, but I'm not sure it's the right choice. These diverse insects share the ability to mix two solutions and enzymes, with the help of two glands, to create a series of reactions, with the end result being a near 100 degrees Celsius substance that practically explodes from the abdomen. It burns due to the heat and is also irritating, with several bursts capable of killing the victim of the attack. While on paper it seems to fit, there are a few issues. Firstly, the fact that due to the heat 20% of the spray instantly evaporates and changes the mixed amounts to several hundred or even thousand times of the original could have unforeseen effects on both the volatility of the resulting mix as well as the strength of the explosion potentially blowing the Bonacon to kingdom come. Speaking of which, this mechanism leads to the solution being discharged as a result of the reaction, not with the help of muscles, leading to the range and potentially the exact direction of the shot being out of the hands, well, as of the Bonacon. Not to mention that the way this evolved is very specific to beetles, making it highly unlikely to also appear in bovine buttocks. The other solution could be formic acid, which would be a better fit. Formic acid is most common in ants, who use them to attack other animals or defend themselves. In high concentrations it can be very dangerous, as it burns on contact. What's more, formic acid can formulate naturally, even in humans, with methanol being the basis of the reaction. Methanol most likely originates from the fruits we eat, but can also be produced from other plant materials. Thus, with a herbivorous diet and dedicated organs to facilitate the production of this substance, it is viable. Although the storing glands need some defensive coating, lest the Bonacon loses its butt. There is one issue, however. It's not easy to mix dung and formic acid. 
so the scholars of the time would not claim that it excretes fire. So what's up with that? Well, <laughs> there really is no nice way to put it. Spraying all that acid must be hard. They are probably prone to shit themselves while straining. With the biology done, we can see that the Bonacon does not fit any predisposed classification beyond bovine, since most cows don't fart acid. In this unique case though, we do have a Latin name, Bonazes, which would make a nice genus name. If it were up to me, I would dub it Bonazus vulgaris, or common Bonacon, since it has quite a habitat range. Speaking of which, next on our list are the places it inhabits. Peonia is a good start, but since we cannot rely so heavily on medieval world maps, its Asian spread can only be defined as roughly the northern parts. Based on this, we can assume that regions like the Gobi Desert and the Mongolia Manchurian grasslands are the places we could find the Bonnacon. These vast lands support other animals of similar size and needs, like the Mongolian wild ass, the bacterian camel and the Mongolian gazelle. While these lands are harsh, a bovine species grazing here is not unfeasible. Even today, people herd their animals on these grasslands, and the only problem Bonacons would face is that mud baths are quite limited here. And what about the Peonian habitat? Vegetation-wise, it fits, because dry grasslands are common there. But what's up with the distance? It's not unusual for such animals to have migratory tendencies, walking large distances of land in their search for large grazing grounds, but the Gobi Desert to graze would be highly unlikely. The most likely scenario would see the Bonacons inhabiting this huge span of land. Of course the populations would be separated, since the grasslands themselves are not continuous, but a large part of Eurasia would see a few of their communities. This, though, raises another question. How can this species be so successful as to inhabit such a significant portion of the world? We needn't go further than the example presented by the Bombardier beetles to answer this. Even though we do not use their exact chemical process, the two defense mechanisms are effectively the same and no animal eats Bombardier beetles. This might not apply one for one to Bonacons, but Imagine for a moment that you are a wolf. What would you rather attack? Something that sprays burning acid into your face? Or something else that potentially runs faster? Oi, you be a chicken. I hear you say. You said that in medieval times scholars moved the animal exclusively to Asia. So what's up with that? Well, to answer that, dear viewer, we have to move on to discussing its potential influence, as the two are linked. Based on depictions, hunting was imagined to be strongly associated with the beast. It was, after all, a large mammal in ancient Europe, so we can safely assume that it was methodically exterminated for fun, like so many other species. Perhaps in Pliny's time the Bonnacon was already overhunted, surviving only in Peonia. While acid spraying might save them from ordinary predators, it only incentivizes hunting for the most vicious one. So, what about the Asian population? It's not like people there were much better when it came to keeping animals alive. Well, the steppes and deserts are sparsely populated, putting less pressure on the species, even more so since locals might be more inclined to hunt for food and not sport in their harsh environment. That being said, the species composition of the Bonacon's habitat would change drastically. If we introduce a large mammal to the mix, which competes for food with many other animals, while also being practically impervious to predation, these habitats are already fragile due to overgrazing among other human effects. I regret to say, but if the Bonacon were to exist, there is a very high likelihood of several local species going extinct and others being pushed further to the brink. Nah, <laughs> what a lovely note to end on. Anyway, thanks for joining me on my dissection of the Bonacon, and as always, I hope to see you next time. If you have any monsters I should cover, drop a comment, and pressing the like button would also be appreciated. Bye.